Okay, we'll get started with the last panel of the day. I'd like to thank the governor and the Western Governors Association for the participation in this very important workshop. Um, the theme of this panel is lessons learned, elements of successful collaboration, and perhaps we'll be able to answer some of the questions from the, the last questions that Robin had. We have an excellent panel today to address this topic. They all have different experiences at different levels and perhaps different and maybe similar perspectives. All of the speakers have will add a minute to their time because sadly Tony Coulter from Sun Mountain couldn't make it and he regrets that because he really was looking forward to this panel. So we'll begin with Sarah Lundstrom. Sarah is um, with the National Parks and Conservation Association and is a member of the Whitefish Range Partnership. And to prove how good we are at collaboration, we collaborated beforehand and decided we were going to sit down for this panel. So in addition to working for the National Parks Conservation Association, I serve as the secretary and chief cat herder of the Whitefish Range Partnership. And the goal of the Whitefish Range Partnership was to work together to create a shared vision and management recommendations for the public lands managed by the Flathead National Forest in an area commonly known as the Whitefish Range. It's a piece of ground that is west of Glacier National Park, south of Canada, and north of Flathead Lake. And we wanted to get in front of forest planning, so we started coming together and meeting in the fall of 2012. We're a diverse group, snowmobilers, tribes, wilderness supporters, mountain bikers, loggers, backcountry horsemen, ATV riders, park advocates, hunters and anglers, raft guides, realtors, ski area managers, local citizens and businessmen. It's a big group. We met for 13 months over elk lasagna and, and microbrews, venison chili, and gluten-free cornbread. We spent hundreds of hours negotiating our agreement, and we're still working together. We're currently writing group comments on the draft forest plan for the Flathead National Forest that are due in October. So I'm going to give you a brief overview of what we did or what we think we did that made us successful, uh, a couple of lessons learned, and some questions and some advice going forward. We spent our first couple of meetings talking about our rules and policies and laying them out and discussing who else needed to be in the room of our partnership, focusing on those who live, work, and play in the whitefish range. I think a lot of those rules kept us in line and, and led to our success, everything from where we met to having a chairman who is trusted by everybody. And obviously every collaborative is different and has to find their own way, but these are the top five things that we did that I think led to our success. First, we laid the groundwork beforehand. We went out to individuals and organizations and talked about the importance of forest planning and what we could do with our group. Second, we created a joint vision statement, which was important for a lot of reasons, but the key was is that everybody's interest was represented in it. That meant we could go back to it when we were working on issues, if we had problems, if we ran into conflict and that every member of our partnership signed on to support the entire agreement. And that required a lot of compromise. Third, we had the Forest Service give us an immovable objects presentation, those things that can't be addressed in forest planning. So we were all starting from the same base of knowledge. That's things like grizzly bear core, inventory roadless areas, wild and scenic rivers, and lynx critical habitat. And according to one of our members, after that we got down with deciding what to do with the last 13 acres. <laughs> It's kind of true. Fourth, we required 
unanimous agreement, which is a really high bar to meet, but it gave us a better product in the long run. Coupled with that, we were, had the rule that you couldn't just say no. You had to come back with a different alternative. And finally, we had the Forest Service in the room, not as voting members, but advisors and, as advisors and guides to provide us knowledge on issues and to keep us within the bounds of law. And we were successful. We handled it, handed in our unanimous agreement to the Forest Service right at our deadline, which happened to be the start of elk season. Um, but at that point, we realized that's just the beginning of the process. Multi-year planning requires long-term commitment. And we quickly realized we needed to have projects to keep our collaborative working together over the long term. So we created our Whitefish Face Working Group, which worked on on-the-ground NEPA projects in recreation, fields reduction, and watershed restoration in the southern end of the Whitefish Range. And we also have our North Fork Trails Initiative, which is focused on maintaining, restoring, and building a trail network in the Whitefish Range. We did realize after the draft forest plan came out that we needed to have a policy in place for how to deal with agency decisions or documents that were released that gave one group more at the expense of another. Um, and we're still working on that, so it's taken a while. Um, all this brings me to the question of how do we work better together going forward? And I thought about it, and you've heard a lot of the same comments and questions that I probably have. Um, and you know, it, the question is, how do we empower how empower the collaboratives while keeping the agencies and having them maintain their decision making authority? How do we keep both independent from one another? Um, you know, how how do we how do the agencies deal with the complications of essentially having a mandate to collaborate without it having being built into law? It's complicated stuff. Uh, so that brings me to some advice for collaboratives and agencies. The first piece of that is to find a way to meaningfully engage the agencies in the process, such as we did as advisors and guides. Um, we also need to find a way to empower collaboratives in a regulatory way because our collaborative, agree collaborative agreement that took hundreds of hours is treated the same as any other comment received. And we put a lot of work and time and compromise into it. And then finally, the collaboratives do need to start seeing their ideas enacted. Because if they don't, we are going to stop and have collaborative fatigue, um, using that word, and we're, we're going to lose that expertise, that local knowledge. Cal collaboratives can and do provide valuable resources. We just need to find a way to empower them and to work together, because that's going to be important for creative land management into the future. So with that, thank you to the Western Governors Association for the opportunity to share our Whitefish Range partnership um, experience. And I'm looking forward to further discussion. Thanks, Sarah. Jennifer is a district ranger on the Missoula Ranger District, and she's in the batting order. Hi, good afternoon. So, um, as mentioned, my name is Jen Hensick, and um, I'm the Missoula District Ranger. I've been here a couple of years. Um, and I'm going to set the stage a little bit for you um, before I go into some of my lessons learned. And some of you that, are, that know this area or that live here probably know this story. And some of you know it a lot better than I do, having been a part of a collaborative that's been located here for quite some time. So just a little bit um, to zoom in on my most recent experience with collaboratives. Um, we have a local uh, collaborative here, the Lolo Restoration Committee. And they are essentially a, a, a member or a, portion, a part of the Montana Forest Restoration Committee uh, in general, although the name has changed, I know. Um, but so this particular group has been together for, for a long time, since 2007 or 8, I think. Um, and so, and then in 2009, there was a discussion uh, with that particular collaborative about where are our priorities? What are, what are the collaborative's priorities? What are the Forest Service's priorities? And where do we want to go? Where do they overlap? We were really lucky here in Missoula that we had a lot of those overlap opportunities. The collaborative was interested in looking into um, Western Larch restoration, and the Forest Service is looking at um, priority areas in the wildland urban interface. Um, we happen to have that right here north of town, and in those of you that are familiar with town, um, that's in the Rattlesnake National Recreation Area and adjacent. The project itself we called Marshall Woods um, because there's Woods Gulch and Marshall Creek, and those two particular areas were drivers for, th for the project. There were some key components throughout the, the, the discussions with the committee, um, and that was in relation to the importance of having public involvement and public engagement and really 
setting the stage for education. And that was a, that's a huge driver of the project. And because, number one, that it's so close to town, and we can highlight those things right here in our own backyard. And so we have taken that to heart, and we still really carry that forward, and I'll talk about that in a second. So the, the overview of the project is just to, you know, emulate fire on the landscape to reduce, you know, public and firefighters' uh, risk and, and really to look at resilient forests. And of course, like I said, the public education piece and because we're in a national recreation area, recreation enhancements as well. So to, to frame this a little bit, the, we came out with a, with a collaborative group in 2009 um, and had a lot of really great conversations with the community. One of the most important lessons learned, I think, that um, we had as an agency is we shelved the project for a number of years after that. So we had, uh, we had this, and you know, and it was for good reasons, but we had, we had this, this period of time where the collaborative wasn't meeting as often or as engaged in this particular project, and the public kind of forgot about it for a while. And so then um, I came to the forest in 2014, and that fall and then into the next spring, we were ready to put out our environmental analysis document to the public. And, and it took some people by a surprise. And despite some of our best efforts um, to, to re-engage with the public, it felt like we should have taken more time. So that's another lesson learned for me, is that we need to take time to build those relationships and really have those conversations with the community. So that being said, um, we came through that whole process um, in about a year or so. And then uh, in January of this year, I got the opportunity to sign the decision. And we came through that process, and the project looks different than what we proposed to the public. But I think the project is an excellent springboard for where we are um, in our conversation about things like cohesive strategy, and as well as an, an excellent opportunity to engage local partners. So I just had a few, list here of a few things I'll, I'll mention. What, who are the right people at the table? And have we engaged them in a regular and consistent way? Um, who, who's, the, who's in the leadership position? I heard Sarah mention that, that there was a, a trusted advisor at the head of the, of the collaborative. That's something that I think of as well. I think about um, what it, fully understanding how the collaborative operates and from an agency perspective, not being at every meeting necessarily, but fully understanding that, walking in and trying to work hard to build those relationships from the get-go. Um, considering to develop and revisit uh, working norms, a charter, operations, those sorts of things for how the agency engages with the collaborative and how the collaborative functions within itself as well. And then I think about um, holding each other accountable. You know, we, we all need to have um, and be, be thoughtful and forthright and upfront and all those important words. And, and we need to hold each other accountable to those things. Um, just a couple more here. Um, maintaining consistency with incoming staff. Like I mentioned, I've been here two years and this process started in 2009. So bringing in new people and the agency, that happens all the time, and in the collaboratives, it happens to a degree as well, especially if there's a lag in, in some of the um, project activity. So I think spending some time and really rebuilding those relationships and getting everybody up to speed is really important. And when I interviewed for the job here, I knew that there was an incredibly engaged community, and I was really excited about that. But one thing I told my boss is that, you know, I can be relatively impatient. And what I've learned as well is that I've got to be patient. And it takes time and those, you know, I'm, I know you all are either members of the collaboratives or worked with collaboratives and being patient and taking time is something that's been um, certainly a lesson learned for me. Um, the last thing I'll say is really taking stock in, in victories and recognizing what is coming from some of the projects that you work on and really reflecting on that. We've talked about that a little bit and telling the story, those sorts of things. One of the things that we did because of that educational component part of this project is um, brought on someone who their whole job, because my whole staff is tasked already, and their whole job was to interface with the public. 
and to talk about and to tell the story for this particular project. And that was huge to be able, and we actually have a field trip tomorrow night. You're welcome to attend if you'd like. Um, and so we are actually, you know, spending that extra time and energy on that and money. Um, and I, but I think that's a really important investment and, and thinking about how, um, you know, that person was helping me bring the, you know, the media out and answering questions and those sorts of things, press releases, et cetera. So that's just one of the other really important pieces that I'd say was a, part of our success here. In addition, you know, we're really fortunate to have um, some incredible relationships here, particularly with our state partners. So just a shout out to, to Angela um, to thank her for some of her energy and effort related to working with private landowners because what has happened now that the Forest Service, we're running saws in people's backyards because again, this is wooey. Um, people have recognized that they are interested in doing work on the property as well. And so we are capitalizing on that as, as much as we can right now and knowing that our state partners are there with us is huge. So with that, thanks. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. Great, great examples, Sarah, too. Uh, just excellent. Our, our last speaker on the panel is Cassandra Mosley. And Cassandra is the Director of Institute for Sustainable Environment at the University of Oregon. And she has a larger, broader view because she has studied collaboration in the country. So, Cassandra. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think my job somehow is, well, I don't know if I can do this. I know I can't do this job, but apparently my job is to summarize 20 years of research on forest collaboratives. Um, I, um, yeah, and four to five minutes, which, you know, sign up for the class. It'll take you a semester and we'll, we'll get right on that. Um, so I, uh, you know, I came to, uh, I was going to graduate school. I came to uh, Oregon um, in 1995 uh, to write a dissertation on forest and watershed collaboratives. Um, and I, I did that. Um, and I had, long, as, as <laughs> Bill uh, aptly pointed out, I had longer and darker hair then. So um, let me just provide a, a, couple of, a couple of themes. There is a huge literature about forest collaboratives, collaboration in natural resources. Um, and it's sort of been a cottage industry over the last couple of decades in several different um, social science disciplines. So I can't do very much, but let me just maybe highlight a few things that can be helpful for this conversation. And I want to organize those, those thoughts into innovation, implementation, and investment. Um, so we've already touched on some of these themes, themes today, but let me just suggest a few. Um, in the in innovation, so uh, one of the things that you know maybe far better than I is collaboration is hard. It is very, very hard. Um, and collaboration is hard not because of you know, one person or an annoying agency or whatever. Collaboration is hard because it's democracy and democracy sincerely practiced is hard. So the question in that, if that's true all the time, it's always hard, then we think we have to ask ourselves, when do we practice collaboration and when do we not? And what can we do best with collaboration? I think it's a really important question. And I don't think I can settle that here today, but one of the things I want to suggest is that collaboratives, um, can perhaps be most robust when they're being innovative. But I think we don't want to spend all the time and energy and resources to collaborate when we're in violent agreement and we're doing mundane routine activities. It's, that, it's going to be a lot of work no matter what. Maybe we don't need to do it for everything. But I would say that things that where, where, where we need to innovate, where we have enough, we don't maybe have total agreement, but we have enough agreement that the problem is solvable and that we work together on things that um, where there are real problems that need to be solved, right? Those are the easier things to collaborate on than I'm in this camp and you're in that camp and ne'er the twain shall meet. So innovation, we've got climate change, we have wildfire, we have rural economic revitalization, we have all these really big problems and that's where I'm going to suggest we could find the sweet spot in, in collaboration and then that, that's really run innovation. So the second thing I want to talk about is, is implementation. Um, we've already talked about that a lot today and I almost put a big X through this part of my talk earlier. Um, but I actually think there's, there's maybe two things I want to say. I think that innovation, um, or excuse me, in implementation, one of the, the truths that I was watching as I walked into uh, one of my case studies, which was the Applegate Partnership, they'd been already meeting when I showed up for several years in 1995. 
um, was that they had believed that if they would just reach agreement, they could hand this off to the Forest Service or and the BLM and they could all go home. Um, we all know that that is actually uh, not how it works, that, that reaching uh, agreement is the first step. It's not the last step. And so I think that we, we need to be setting up our collaborative processes um, to be prepared for the fact that implementation is part of the collaborative process and that uh, collaboratives are often venues in which organizations come together and that if we're, we have to figure out how those constituent organizations are going to help with the implementation process. And that isn't just, I, I mean that broadly, many times uh, when you have a collaborative agreement, it's to do rural economic development and do land management. So Forest Service isn't going to do your economic development for you, and they're not going to do your fisheries work on your on your range, your private range lands. This is implementation, really multi, multi-stakeholder implementation, not just multi-stakeholder uh, agreement building. So we need to be dogging the, 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 the process of implementing our agreement. And then I think the other area, which is maybe where we've spent most of our time today, is thinking about the structural changes we need to make um, in, in the agency, the Forest Service and other agencies to make uh, implementation easier. Um, and I want to raise a flag. One thing that um, some research that I've been doing with a colleague at Colorado State, Courtney Schultz and I have spent the last three years studying the um, integrated resource restoration line item pilots in regions one, three, and four. And that hasn't come up today, but I think one of some of our key findings of that research is that um, it, the IRR budget pilots are, are improving um, prioritization I'm making it easy for the agency to prioritize and to do integrated restoration, which are things that I've heard a lot in collaboratives. And so I want to flag that, particularly for those of you who I'm in Region 6, we don't get to have this pilot, um, but Regions 1, 3, and 4, that we look for that and understand whether that is an, an opportunity to make structural change, to make landscape scale uh, collaboration and implementation of it easier. So the third area I want to talk about um, is investment. Um, and again, this is a topic we've covered a fair amount today. Um, uh, the most stark example, of course, is the, the decline of, um, of, of non-fire related uh, agency budgets and that, the challenge that that creates for implementation. Um, we, we know we need reinvestment in um, the, the process of, of implement, implementing projects and that is not a small piece. Um, but I also want to add that I think that you all know, as folks who participate in collaboratives, that we have to be investing in the collaborative process. And that is both um, uh, agencies bringing their resources to the table, us finding uh, sources of money for the, the uh, folks who are the lead cat herders, right? This is the time consuming process. And sometimes we're lucky enough that an organization can bring their own resources to the table. But frankly, that is not how it happens very often. That th there needs to be some source of money for the chief cat herder. In Oregon, um, in region six, the Forest Service has run a, uh, with the National Forest Foundation, a collaborative uh, land stewardship program for a number of years. And now the state of Oregon has been funding collaborative capacity as well. And that's made a huge difference in Oregon, which has a collaborative forest collaborative on every single national forest. And in many cases, there's multiple collaboratives, sort of a similar density to Oregon. So I want to say that if we, if we think about investment, we be, need to be thinking about investment and implementation and the expensive work of getting the work done on the ground, but also on the, on the collaborative side of the story. So let me just conclude quickly with the, the, a point that um, maybe 20 years and a lot of less, a lot of gray hair of studying collaboratives and participating in them. I think it's really vital that we um, build on what we know about collaborative processes and there's a huge opportunity to have leaps forward with the focus of the WGA on this and I would urge us all to learn from uh, prior WGA work in this area of forest health, uh, forest uh, and range management, um, we, that we really use the practitioners, the folks in this room who have hard fought lessons learned and also not um, forget that we do have 20 years of master's theses and many journal articles and other things that really summarize and identify the key ingredients and the lessons learned that we can springboard rather than reinvent. So thank you. Thank you, Cassandra. Okay, we'll open with questions from the audience. Thanks. 
Uh, Mo Bookwalter um, with the state DNRC. So my question is for Cass, and I, the state of Montana has, through our Forest and Focus Initiative, supported some collaborative engagement on the ground, but I know it's not enough, and there is more support that's needed. So I guess, I, I believe the support you were referencing is the CCLS program? So we have, there were sort of two programs, sorry, going fast there. Um, there's two programs um, that I think are worth highlighting. And uh, one is the CCLS program, which is a forest service funded program um, that in which the money uh, is comes from the NFS budget in region six and goes to the, and region 10, 10 and five actually as well, goes to the National Forest Foundation is competitively awarded to collaborative groups um, who are prepared to engage in, in, in processes that meet those criteria. It's been, it's been a game changer, I would say. Um, and then in the, also in Oregon, um, this, the Oregon State Legislature has uh, now two biennia, biennia in a row invested in um, a program where they've funded um, collaborative groups, uh, technical assistance for those collaborative groups, and also a process to help um, accelerate implementation by making available state uh, either contracted resources or state employees to do things like timber stand marking or LIDAR or the things that you need to do implementation. So that three-prong approach with the state has also been really critical. Sure, so I guess my follow-up question is, you said you mentioned it's a game changer. So how, how are those CCLS dollars and some of the state funds infused to have support collaboratives, what, how are they the game changer? Right. Around? What are they doing? I think, um, I think that in the, particularly specifically with the collaborative um, funding, what they're doing is they're funding the cat herding. And I think that one of the things that we tend to think of, or some people have this mental image of that a collaborative is a Wednesday night from 7 to 8.30, we all show up and then we go home. That is not, that is not a way to make a, a collaborative go, right? You, there's a ton of shuttle diplomacy. There's simple things like note taking and and where we're going to meet and all that stuff. But really, there's all the in-between work of going and talking to people and making sure we have agreement and organizing the field trip and keeping calling people so they come back. And Sarah knows this for, she, this is her living, right? Um, so those things, if they're not funded, collaboratives um, can really dissipate and just lose energy and and run out of steam much more quickly. I, I think that's fairly clear in uh, both empirically and sort of anecdotally. George. Earlier in the day, somebody made the statement that uh, some organizations have conflict as part of their business plan, which I found to be quite true. And I wonder if you have any advice about how to include those who are very critical, but will not participate because it's part of their agenda. So, as far as advice on that, um, you know, from my perspective, it's um, reaching out to those folks and having conversations. Now, some are not willing, and I'll tell you that. But, um, you know, if, if there's ways to have and listen in those conversations. I think somebody was talking about that earlier. Um, I think that's an important step. Um, you know what I've also found too is that uh, a lot of um, a, a visit to the field really dissolves a lot of barriers for whatever reason. I don't know if because you're sweating and walking together. I'm not sure why, but you know I, I think that really spending some time. And dedicating that, you know, and spending that grassroots effort is is um, an investment. I think the other piece of that is, and, and one of the reasons why we spent so much time writing a joint vision statement is so that everybody saw their interests as part of that, um, because it focuses on what we have in common, not what is our difference. And by focusing on what we have in common, we can start building the trust that we need to tackle the harder pieces. Though at the same time, I also agree there are some groups that just aren't going to come to the table. So I, I think that um, if you've gone as far as you can go reasonably with inclusivity, um, and in, in some of the collaboratives we have in Oregon, you know, we have former litigants who are saying, you know, if you write the NEPA that way, it's not going to, you know, they're really actively working on make sure, making sure that they're being productive. And so we've seen some real transition. We also have a couple of folk who um, tried out collaboratives for a while. It wasn't for them. 
they're still going to work from the outside. And in those cases, barring solutions which change their rights as um, appellants or as, as citizens uh, of whatever way, I think that planning for that process, assume you're going to get appealed and make sure you have, so let's say, let's assume that every time you're going to get, you're going to get appealed and then you're going to get lit or you have pre-decisional objections and then you have a litigation. Plan for it. Put it in your timeline. Make sure that you've got your, your documents in line and then just that's part of the planning process and it's up front as an it doesn't doesn't make it not frustrating it doesn't make it um but but we shouldn't pretend that, that if, if you're in that environment it's going to be a surprise oh we didn't know we were going to get litigated if you always litigated you're always litigated let's just plan for it put it in the timeline and and figure out how you're going to deal with it i think that that it's a pragmatic solution may not be with the solution you want Other questions? Uh, Kathleen Williams from the Western Landowners Alliance. And this may be a question more relevant to, to more remote areas. And it goes beyond collaboration. But we've talked a lot about trust and relationships and um, working with private landowners. Um, so the question is, that the um, the tendency in, in agencies where you have to move to move up, um, a lot of our members, especially in very far flung rural areas, they they just get to the point where they're trusting their range con or or their district ranger or whoever, and then that person moves on. And and Jennifer, you mentioned the fact that new people are coming in. Do you, from an agency perspective, do you think there's any um, potential in looking at that promotion structure and seeing if there's ways to allow people to advance in place either through a step system and then get additional um, landscape experience by doing maybe details. Um, it just seems like a structural problem in, in especially in the federal agencies that you it's a revolving door and it it seems like it could be much better somehow. I just want maybe all of you to reflect on that. Yeah, you know, um, I'm not, I probably have to defer to some of the other folks in this room. Oh, I'm happy to. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, that that's, um, it, it's definitely something that um, we recognize, you know, at, in needing to have that consistency, um, you know, with, with our partners. And I think that, you know, when I'm looking at, filling a position, for example, you know, if I, I look at, you know, the whole spectrum of staff that I have, for example. So you think about, you know, what, what are those personalities and those traits that you have and you have, and, and we really need some corporate memory. We need those folks who want to be around for a while, but we need that infusion of new blood too. And so for me, it's, I think it's a really important mixture of those. And so, you know, at my, my little ranger district scale, those are the kinds of things that I look for. And I, I think that there's also some of that within, um, the, and I don't want to speak for Leanne, but probably at the regional level too, thinking about, you know, what we've had a number of folks in place for a long time. You know, I, our, uh, our leader over here, Tim, was in place for quite some time, uh, 15 years, right? 20. 20, sorry, 20 years. Um, as a ranger, you know, so I think that um, we, we do have some of that. Uh, it's probably a little harder to have that consistency in some of our rural areas, but we do have some of that at a, at a, at a higher scale. I'd just like to add a small piece to that. Um, so in academia, we, we, uh, we have uh, come to have to confront the two-body problem. And while Eugene may seem like a thriving metropolis to, to you all, um, there's not a lot of universities in Eugene, and so we struggle to solve the two-body problem in the same way, I think, that uh, rural, isolated rural communities uh, uh, struggle to solve this for the Forest Service. So I think we have to con deal with that reality. Um, it's probably harder than ever in rural communities to find two two professional jobs in one place, and that's a real issue um, that's driving this. And I, I would say that the thing that worries me more than um, people moving up in the agency, uh, in moving to move up, is what happens when they leave and the multiple details. Um, so one of the forests I work with, um, community-based organizations, um, 
one of the local NGOs told me that he'd had uh, 16 rangers, including all the details, in 14 rangers in the 16 years he'd been there. Um, and th and I asked him about that, and it actually wasn't that the rangers themselves who are in the positions move that often. It's that what happens between those permanent rangers that's so disruptive, because you have three or four details. Um, and so I actually think that the the culturally difficult, solving the culturally difficult problem of um, people moving around to move up, maybe not the first problem to solve. We may need to solve the problem of um, how hard it is to find permanent employees and get them in place and get them set up. And I want to also be, uh, give the Forest Service a break on this one too. This is not unique to the Forest Service. This is a federal issue. And so we need to also be sensitive to the fact that um, our Forest Service partners uh, probably don't like the system, the, the difficulty of filling positions any more than the rest of us do. And just from a collaborative perspective really quickly, we were not agency driven at all. We came together on our own um, and regardless of who from the Forest Service was in the room, we were still there. So I think some of that might be helped by you know, having your collaborative drive itself and that way you're building the trust in the room so that whoever comes into that room as your agency person, um, you all still trust each other and are standing with each other and are a united voice to sort of, you know, educate that person when they come in. It, it takes some of the sting away from having somebody new coming in all the time. Yeah, Kevin Chamberlain from Mineral County, Superior District out here. Uh, and this goes directly to her question. We, we had our ranger got transferred to the Tongass and uh, we just had some momentum going and things were going really well with our collaborative, all this kind of thing, and we were all worried it was all gonna go up in smoke. And uh, the Forest Service um, promoted a lady from within, Carol Johnson, who is a lifelong resident of Mineral County, born and raised there, graduated from high school, fair board chairman, and she's our ranger now. And the whole community rallied around her, and so the Forest Service does pay attention to the local, and we're extremely grateful for that, Tim Garcia, and and uh, Leanne Martin and the people that allowed that to occur because it really uh, it really energized the community so excellent discussion we're gonna cut you guys loose we've got one more speaker uh, left today and he's only gonna talk for 30 minutes